In Swahili, Mualimu means teacher. It is therefore appropriate that the African people and most world statesmen address him as Mualimu Nairere. Julius Nairere is among Africa's, indeed the world's, outstanding freedom fighters and leaders. The former school teacher who gave up teaching in 1955 to lead his country's struggle for independence freed Tanzania from colonial rule in 1961. In 1962, Nairere became the first president of independent Tanzania. Though no longer president, as chairman of the all-powerful ruling party, Nairere continues to be the major architect of modern Tanzania. He is also chairman of the South Commission and recipient of the Jawaharlal Nehru Award for Peace and Understanding. Chairman Nairere invited members of the World Report team to fly with him in his special aircraft from the Tanzanian capital Dar es Salaam to Dodoma, 400 kilometers away, where he was to chair the monthly meeting of his party's central committee. The exclusive interview was conducted in Chwamino, a village outside Dodoma, where Mualimu stays whenever he is in this part of Tanzania. Last Sunday, looking for you in Dar es Salaam to work out the logistics of coming to Dodoma, which is 400 kilometers away, we ultimately found you in the local church praying. What role has religion played in your life, sir? I don't know. It, it is very difficult to answer. Uh, to answer that question, how do I answer it? I, I'm a convert to Christianity. I was converted at the age of 12. So if I could, uh, if it was possible to foresee what, what kind of life, what, ca what kind of life I would have led without being converted as a, to, to Christianity, and compare that with what I have become as a Christian, if the two would be different, it would be easy to, to say, you know, you see, I, if I had not become a Christian, I would have, this is the kind of life I would have led but I became a Christian and this is what I am. So it is not easy really to, to, to say how it has affected, but obviously a, a, a major religion like Christianity must affect one's life, although it's not easy to, to pinpoint and say it has affected my life this way. But uh, I believe in Christianity. Uh, it is, uh, so you try to to live according to its principles, and when you break them, you say, well, but I think I have broken the Christian principle there. Yeah. But I can't, I can't say more than that. Sir, at the Belgrade summit of the non-aligned, uh, one school of thought was that in the fast-changing world, the non-aligned countries and the movement must shed its rhetoric on, on colonialism, imperialism, and so on, and join serious dialogue with the North for economic uh, advance and dialogue among themselves. Uh, the other school of thought, of course, other view was that changing track at this point would be premature because, uh, because well, colonialism remains, I mean, so long as Namibia remains, and so on. What advice would you give? In, uh, how would you intervene in this debate? Well, unfortunately, I did intervene. Uh, it's, uh, and, and the colonialism part is not simply Namibia. I wish it were simply Namibia. The, the problem of power uh, is a continuing problem, and it does not end when the countries have become independent. So I did say in my own, uh, my own intervention there, uh, fortunately, they, 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 uh, they did allow me in my capacity as chairman of the South Commission to make a statement. And I suppose it was because of that mood that perhaps now we should be talking in terms of uh, uh, dialogue with the North rather than confrontation, as if we don't want dialogue with the North. We, uh, in the 70s, you may remember, we, we did uh, seek for dialogue with the North. We wanted to sit down with the North and talk together with the North about the economic, uh, uh, the, the economic situation as it is, that is affect, as it does affect the, the countries of the South. So I did say, because of that mood, I did say in my own intervention, I don't know whether I can remember the, 
the exact phrase, but uh, I, I, I warned the non the non aligned movement that it is they must not uh, think that uh, that imperialism is dead because imperialism is not dead and 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 su supposing supposing the non aligned movement all of us in the south all of us in the south said ah imperialism is dead supposing we we, we made the, we took that position there is no imperialism imperialism has died but that does not kill imperialism Imperialism is a reality. It's a question of power, and uh, the 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 use of power to dominate others has not gone. It is still there. So, if you like, yes, I I would like to. I I, I want to to see genuine dialogue between the north and the south, uh, and we should not have unnecessary confrontation with the north and the south. But. Uh, the the north is powerful the north uses its power economic power uh, technological power sometimes military power to dominate the south and when you have that kind of situation the situation itself has within it the confrontation it's not uh, it's not a subjective thing the the situation itself has confrontation in it just as colonialism uh, had uh, confrontation it in it within the colonized and the colonizer and today uh, the 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 situation uh, where the north is powerful uh, and uses that power to dominate to exploit the south that situation has domination has confrontation in it it's not uh, something subjective so what is one to make of this word development the purpose of life is the pursuit of happiness or is the purpose of life the accumulation of wealth and the evolution of a consumer society? How would you sketch the sensible middle path? Well, I don't know whether I sketch, I could say, say, sketch sensible middle path. Whether it is pursuit of happiness, I don't know. Uh, because happiness becomes a matter of philosophy. Uh, I'm not quite sure that uh, the, the millionaire is necessarily happier than uh, the poor man. I don't know. This is a philosophical matter. But uh, health is something that everybody desires. So people should be healthy. Uh, whether that will make them happy, I don't know. But people should be happy, healthy. Everybody wants a, a healthy body and a healthy mind, I suppose. Uh, food. We need food. Uh, whether food makes people happy, I don't know. But hunger does not make them. Hunger does not make them happy. People have to have sufficient food to eat. Uh, education. Uh, whether educated people are happier. Uh, whether I'm happier now because I'm educated uh, than I would have been if I was uh, an ignoramus. I didn't know anything. If I, I remained superstitious, I'd never heard about the word science. It's just possible. I might be. I might have been happier. It's not not a question of being happy, but you you we can't have a community, an ignorant community, and uh, and keep uh, education from the masses of the people because we thought ignorant people are more educated. And so, th this is, it. It is development. Then is the is a process to help people, to help people, to, it's a bad thing to, to use development to define development, but to become their best. People must become their best. Everybody must get a chance to become their best. This is development. What has been your experience as chairman of the South Commission these past three years? Do you despair? Are you hopeful? I don't despair. Uh, it is true when you see the problems of the South, and I've seen them. I, I was, uh, I've been a Southerner always. I've led my country as uh, first of as leader of my own party, and then head of state of my own country for a long time. And I was involved in these problems of development. But uh, I was, uh, I, I didn't get sufficient time. I did not have time. I traveled, but I did not travel as much as I did. I have done during the last two years in the third world. So I've learned. Uh, so the first thing I've done is to learn a great deal of learning. And I'm very grateful to, for the opportunity to enable me to learn. I, I see the, the immensity of 
the problems which the South face. First of all, just the problem. Even if the North was not there, it's just the South and forget the North. And the South is there and the South can develop itself without any problems from the North. It's an immense problem. It's still an immense problem. But the South has to develop itself in the shadow of the North. Two ways. One, they have to, they see the North and they say, ah, we want to be like that. Now, I don't know whether they can be like that. So there is this question of the North is developed, we are not developed. To develop, we have to be like the North. This is a, an immense problem. So that's a problem. But the second one is the fact that the North will not allow them <laughs> to develop. But I don't despair, because what I've seen in the North is the capacity to develop. If they will, the, the South will simply say, you know, to develop, we, first of all, we have to decolonize, you know, decolonize the mind as it were also. The South has to have confidence in itself, must have this confidence in itself, and use its own resources to the maximum. They will develop. If they do that, they will develop. Could you give an example? Could you elaborate on this, sir? Well, let me give an example. <laughs> India is not a developed country. But India has technology which ranges from biogas to nuclear energy and everything in between. So India has the technology for a third world. <laughs> and if you forget the North, India is developed. <laughs> if you forget the North, forget this business. So, you know, the North is there, so India looks at the North and feels, oh gosh, how can we be like the North? But India has the means. And if you take that simple one line, energy, biogas, right to, to nuclear energy. So, why shouldn't India look at India <laughs> so that its major strategy is to look at India, uh, not look at anybody else? And there will be things outside India which they need. But India's strategy for development should be India. We have to depend upon India to develop. This is what I mean. The other thing is the South. The South. The South has Tanzania's, but it has India's, it has uh, China's, it has uh, Brazil's. And when you take these countries as a totality, they share this weakness, they share the incapacity to influence the decisions of the world, which affect, affect billions of people. We share that, and therefore we are together. And India, in that sense, India and Tanzania are no difference. We are the same. So why don't we come together? <laughs> Another level of self-reliance. Because if you look, you look at them all, they have almost all we need, <laughs> almost all we need to get out of this weakness. So why do, why do we enhance our own weakness? By looking outside the South, even for things where we don't have to look outside the South. Because the South is there. This is what I, I mean. Right, but still the problem is that various countries in the South, countries in the Arab world, countries elsewhere, where they, they will not look to India, they will not look to China, they will continue to uh, look uh, Japanese technology, German technology, and American technology, and so on. So that the problem remains. How do you, how do you bring about this consensus? The problem sir? remains, yes, it's true. One is habit. I mean, we do that also in Tanzania. Mm. And we will go out to the north for technology which is around in the south. Actually, we'll go out to outside Tanzania for technology which is available in Tanzania. Mm. One is habit. One is habit. One, I say, is uh, a mentality. Uh, mm, your, your neighbor's lawn is always greener than your own and, and, and your own and so forth. And, and so we have to break that habit, and, and it takes time to break that habit. I mean, you, I say, w I was born under colonialism. I grew up under colonialism. The people did not really want colonialism. The people of Tanzania well, did not really want to remain colonial. But they were, they were there. 
it was colonialism was a reality and they were victims of colonialism and so you had to start the process of decolonization you had to say we can't continue to live under this and when we did that there were people amongst ourselves who thought this was absurd you how could you do it you people you ha you don't have the technology you don't have the power i suppose when uh, when uh, gandhi started you know people must say how can you get rid of the empire you have nothing and so forth so it's a process but that process has to start and i'm saying the south can the south can do that uh, the it's not only the Arab countries, it's all, all of us, including, including Tanzania. We, we have this mentality. We will not uh, enhance our own capacity. We will weaken our own capacity and enhance the capacity of the North to dominate us. And this is wrong. When elephants fight, it the is the grass is that suffers. <laughs> when elephants make love, it, is it also that ruins. Suffers. <laughs> it is also the, <laughs> the grass that, that suffers. suffers. Now, this picturesque phrase was used just the other day by one of your leaders. Do you fancy this metaphor for the relationship between the superpowers at the moment? <laughs> well, first of all, may I tell you the, uh, the st a story about that, uh, that metaphor? Right, right. In 1973, the Commonwealth met in Algiers. Ottawa, no, the okay. Commonwealth. What's Commonwealth that? met in Ottawa. All right. And and that was the period when uh, the North was talking about detente, and uh, Brezhnev was pushing for detente, and uh, and uh, the Northwest had accepted this idea. And in uh, Ottawa, uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Ted Heath at that time, uh, was explaining the importance of this, the importance of detente and it took a long time to explain and and why he was taking such a long time to explain was that uh, the prime minister of singapore was not really didn't think there was very much in this this was the west abandoning the 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 leaving the 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 far east and this was he didn't like this idea at all and he was taking a lot of time to explain the importance of this and i thought i must reassure this man why does he take such a long time uh, to explain a uh, detente so i said uh, mr prime minister let me assure you why do you take all this such a long time we don't, we don't want trouble between the between between the superpowers what good does it does swahili in swahili there is a saying mm -hmm. in truhili when the elephants fight <laughs> it is the grass that suffers and Lee Kuan Yew is a very intelligent person and very quick, he said, when the elephants make love, it is the grass that suffers. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was Lee Kuan Yew. It was not mine. It was a retort from Lee Kuan Yew. <laughs> I see. So the point is, do, uh, is this an accurate description of the well, possibility? Well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, you know, you have to think about that because, uh, because we in Africa have suffered both. The elephants have fought in Africa, and we suffered when the elephants were actually fighting in Africa. But the elephants made love about Africa also. You know. And uh, the partition of Africa was actually a making of love. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they met in Berlin, and they were not fighting in Berlin at all. They met in Berlin in 1884 to, to partition Africa without fighting. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, there is some truth in all this... Uh, this uh, statement there is an element of truth and I think what people are trying to say is yes we would like the Northeast and the Northwest to stop that tensions because that tensions now between between the East and the West can be very dangerous to everybody including the South so we should welcome this uh, the making of love between this the the, the Northeast and the Northwest but of course, you, you do say the, the North is very powerful. Uh, supposing the North was to make love simply to dominate the South. Uh, well, I mean, this, this we have to say. What does this mean to us? What does it mean to us? It can mean peace, yes, but peace, peace for what? Because peace is, uh, is, uh, peace is a product, I keep repeating this, peace is a product of justice. How do you read the processes of perestroika and glasnost? initiated by Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. Do you see these processes with a degree of hope 
or as a wise statesman do are you apprehensive what is happening what what uh, president gorbachev have ushered into the the present time first of all is the the relation between east and west and this is clear uh, and i think this is a good development i think i think everybody of goodwill should encourage that uh, because it's a positive thing uh, any kind of war now between uh, between the, the superpowers is unacceptable to everybody it, uh, so so that is a trend which is fine but the internal and uh, what is happening internally first of all let me say i don't know what is what what the kind of trend that is taking place in eastern europe i i can't say i understand what is going on but let me say this if the soviet union the leadership is saying how can you have socialism without democracy how can you call this democracy how can you pretend that this is democracy it is not possible to have socialism without freedom socialism should be the acme of freedom not its opposite now if if perestroika or glasnost or whatever it is i don't i don't understand this if the changes are intended to answer this question in a positive manner i think that should be encouraged by every socialist everywhere every socialist i am i'm a socialist and and i don't want to be told you know you people you social what kind of socialism is this and and socialism should should really be mean freedom if these are the changes which are taking place in the in the in the east the freeing socialism the making socialism a free socialism the making socialism with a human face and it's absurd that socialism should have anything but a human face it is really ridiculous why should socialism have anything other than a human face it is capitalism which should have any inhuman face not not to socialism so if if that is what the change is intended to do that should be welcomed but there are those who believe and especially in the west those who believe what is happening in the west in in the east is uh, that uh, the east is abandoning abandoning socialism now if that were to be true uh, then uh, as a socialist I would, I would be very oppressive but if the the idea is to free socialism free socialism from the from the the strictures of stalinism then i would i'd feel quite happy now the changes in the soviet union and in china they do indicate that state control of the economy has not been good for the generation of wealth and do you go along with that at least it's one thing to say if you have too much control you reach a stage where if you have too much control there is a stage where too much control becomes negative so it's just possible the soviet union has reached a position where if you don't if you don't unleash the creativity of the population uh, you you constrain development uh, and therefore now it is necessary uh, to to lessen control to lessen central control uh, that that could be true but it is not necessarily true to say if you did not have the previous control <laughs> you would have reached that position you can never be sure uh, that uh, these countries would have that the soviet union would by now be a superpower uh, i i i don't know because because really this is the would have been the would have been of history and would have been is absurd so it is absurd for the soviet union it, if, if the leadership says we have to change they must change now because they have reached a stage of development 
that are superpower. They've reached a stage of development. It's no use going on pretending to live like 19, 1940 or 19, 1930 because this is for the Soviet Union. It's not 1930 or 1940 or even 1960. They've reached a stage now they have to, they have to change and modernize themselves. But would have they, we don't know, they would have been. Would they have been a superpower? If they did not have some of the controls, which we are now saying, no, these controls are now wrong, these controls must go, would they have been in that position? I don't know. This is the, this is, this is the would have been of history. What would the Soviet Union have, would have been if, if they did not take the line which they took? I don't know. How, do, how can anybody answer that? China, same thing about China, they have also... Would China, if China, China, one its central position china became china really real china i'm told i don't know i'm not a, such a historian but i'm told china had its first central authority since 1949. its first central authority china has a long history yes and there was always china you know but it never really had a central authority controlling the whole of China. You had warlords all over, and uh, an emperor claiming to be the emperor of all China, but really with warlords or warlords all over. And China, this China we are talking today, is for a short time, very short time, tremendous central control. I don't know whether right. <laughs> I don't know whether if China had been loose, we would be talking about China today. Tanzania and other African states are single party states. Are you opposed to a multi party system for developing countries? Do you think a multi party system can be inaugurated in a country like Tanzania? Oh yes. Oh yes, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I, I, I did, my colleagues and myself, we established uh, a single party system here, not f from philosophy, I'm not, uh, f I'm not committed to a single party as a philosoph philosophical tenet at all. Uh, for, for us it was a practical thing. Uh, first of all, we did not have another party and, and I was not going to create another party in order to please some, some people in the Western world that I couldn't have a democratic government without a second party. Where was I going to get a second party? I didn't have it. We used to, we, the, our first elections, we used to have one party, and we had, we had no elections, in a sense, because our party used to be returned unopposed, no elections, because there was no other party. And so we established a single party by law. But uh, since then, I was very pleased that we were a single party. Uh, because uh, because many of these nations, India is lucky, but many of these nations now who who, who preach to us about about multi parties in 19, 1990, 1989, they they were not built by multi parties. They are monarchies, many of these countries. They are built as nations. They are not built by on on a basis of a multi party system. They are built by families until they became nation. In Belgrade, yourself, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi and others discussed various ways in which you could assist the Namibian election process. What are the hurdles that you foresee where this kind of help is required? First of all, the political hurdles. Uh, we, we must not trust the South Africans. Uh, the, the South Africans have reached this position under pressure. They never wanted to leave Namibia. Even now, I'm not sure. All of us must watch them together. There are some people who simply want, to, you know, they say, watch, watch Swapo. It's not Swapo you want to watch because Swapo want free elections. They, they know they will win. If you have free elections, they know they will win. And they want the independence of their own country. The Commonwealth Summit is round the corner in October in Kuala Lumpur where South Africa will presumably once again be center stage. What course of action do you recommend to get Mrs. Thatcher in line <laughs> somewhere? <laughs> it would be, I, I, I can't try to give advice to anybody to get Mrs. Thatcher in line because nobody can get Mrs. Thatcher in line except Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> so I don't think that is possible. But uh, seriously, uh, I think Mrs. Thatcher is opposed to sanctions. Uh, 
totally opposed to sanctions. And she's going to go to, to Kuala Lumpur saying no sanctions, and she will produce all sorts of reasons. And one of the reasons she, she's going to produce is that there is the clerk, uh, and uh, the clerk now allows the processions to take place, uh, so give him a chance. She will, I think she, she would probably bring that kind of argument. And I don't believe in this. I think the Commonwealth countries must watch out. Really, they've got to be very careful. I said about Namibia, the South Africans did not want to leave Namibia. And, and even now, I'm not sure they will leave. If they leave, they will leave because of the pressures. The South Africans don't want to change apartheid. They have not become poor, you know, seeing the light uh, going on the way to Damascus at all. If there are signs of change in South Africa, it's because of the pressures, the internal pressures and the international pressures. If you relax those pressures, they will relax in comfort in South Africa. So those who want change in South Africa must continue the pressures. The internal pressures must continue and the external pressures must continue. Don't relax those pressures. Even Mrs. Thatcher really must be told, please, don't relax pressures. India gained independence in 1947. You gave up teaching in 1953 to take up public work in, in Tanzania, then Tanganyika. Your freedom struggle was non-violent as indeed was ours. Was Mahatma Gandhi or our freedom struggle something of an inspiration for you? Yes, uh, I, I was quite aware. Of, uh, of the fact that the Indian uh, liberation movement had succeeded uh, on a philosophy of nonviolence. I was quite uh, aware of that and that it could be used. And, and, and I was determined, if, if it was possible, I was absolutely determined that we could win our independence nonviolently. But, uh, but uh, I am not a nonviolent person, uh, philosophically, at all. Uh, Gandhi was non-violent philo philosophically. I was non-violent politically. There was no need. If there is no need to be violent, why be violent? If it was possible to organize ourselves politically and achieve independence without uh, shedding blood, why shed blood? And, and we did succeed. What recollections do you have of Indian leaders that you've met in your innings as president and now as chairman of the party? Well, the Indian leaders I know are really the Gandhis, the, 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 these Gandhis, uh, yes. Mrs. Gandhi and Rajiv. Um, Nehru. Nehru, Nehru I met for a very short time, very short. Uh, people believe because I, I achieved independence while he was Prime Minister of India that I must have met him at, pri at uh, Commonwealth meetings. I didn't because one Commonwealth meeting which we, we went to, I was not, I had resigned, I was not in the government. But I had met him. I met him only once before my country became independent. And it's very interesting. I must tell you what, what he told me. I had gone to the United Nations as a petitioner. Uh, this country was a trust territory under the United Nations. And I was there as a petitioner. Nehru visited the United Nations when we were there. And we were lined up with people from the colonies. We were lined up uh, to meet him. And he came, reached me, and I was introduced to him. And he said to me, I, I remember the exact words. Don't make the mistake we made in India. Take what you can get. <laughs> Those, that was, <laughs> that was uh, Nehru's advice to me. <laughs> uh, take what you can get, meaning what? Yes, I understood it because I was a teacher. I, I, I used to teach colonial history and I knew uh, India, the I Indian National Congress was rather purist. Uh, they were very purist. They wanted to jump from colonialism to independence without any, any, any stages. And I felt, although I did not ask him a question, I felt that is what he meant, that if you can, you can reach independence step by step, do it. I, that is the way I interpreted his, take what you can get. No, I can't resist asking this question I ask many statesmen. Which is the most exciting last book that you have read? read. Do you get time to read? I get time to read. I shouldn't tell you what books I'm reading now. <laughs> but I shouldn't say, do you want me to tell you what a book I'm reading now? Right. And this is going to be my last answer. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I'm reading Machiavelli. <laughs>